Churchill then became certain of ultimate victory. In his telephone conversation with Franklin Roosevelt, the president told the prime minister that they were all in the same boat. Churchill later cabled the Australian prime minister, telling him that the involvement of the United States as a full allied partner made the end certain. Well, that's a view of the Battle of Britain from the outside and the public face of Churchill and cabinet members and some behind-the-scenes political negotiations. Now, let's actually look at the tactics in the Battle of Britain. And I looked at different military history websites, and there was a lot of great information, especially from the RAF Museum, where I looked at tactics from the British side. So we'll look at that first, and then we'll look at Luftwaffe tactics. Let me just paint with some broad strokes first before I get down into the details. One of the main ideas in military thinking at the time was that the bomber will always get through. For the attacker, the task was to inflict sufficient damage on the enemy to bring about his defeat. But the defender had to destroy enough of the attacking force to make it impossible for the campaign to continue. So the military thinking at the time was that with enough bombers, you are at a significant disadvantage on the defense because you had to swat all of these out of the sky, but they only had to get a few through. That's why so many were pessimistic about the Battle of Britain. The key players in this battle were fighter pilots. The Germans had to get sufficient bombers to their targets so they could inflict crippling damage to British infrastructure. A side effect of this would be that the RAF had to respond to such attacks and that in the resulting dogfights, the experienced and seasoned German fighters could decimate the ranks of the RAF Fighter Command. The aim of the British was to deny the Luftwaffe the freedom of action by attacking incoming raids get through the protective screen of German fighters, and destroy the bombers. They believed that the Hurricanes, their fighters, could do this while the Spitfire could deal with the German fighters. But once combat started, it rarely remained so evenly divided. But with the adoption of more open formations, the RAF denied the Luftwaffe total success. We'll get into more detail, but first let's look at Luftwaffe attacks, since they were on the offensive. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. In order to invade Britain, the Germans had to have air superiority over the English Channel. If not, the RAF and the Royal Navy would be able to destroy their invasion force before it reached the shore. Many naval experts have argued that Due to the type of flat-bottom barges built by the Germans, simply running a destroyer squad at full speed through their ranks would have caused many to capsize in the wake from the ships. The troops and their equipment would have suffered heavy casualties, and the invasion would have effectively stopped with little or no gunfire. So the Luftwaffe's command of the air was vital to any plan for an invasion fleet to successfully cross the channel. The German Navy, Army, and Air Force each had separate plans and ideas on how and when the invasion should be launched. There seemed to be little cooperation between them, and despite the impressive buildup of barges and other equipment in the channel ports, the actual detailed planning for operation, codenamed Sea Lion, was never really fleshed out totally. All depended on the success of the Luftwaffe for air superiority before the invasion could be seriously considered. Starting on July 10, 1940, the Luftwaffe attacked shipping convoys in the Channel and Channel ports. They also suspected the importance of the British radar masts and attacked the stations on the south coast, damaging some badly. One of the aircraft types used in these raids was the Stuka dive bomber. These were accurate and had been particularly successful earlier in the war when there was no effective fighter resistance. But when dive bombing, they were vulnerable to attacks against them and the hurricanes and spitfires of fighter command found them easy prey. Because of their heavy losses, they were withdrawn from battle in mid-August. In this stage, in mid-1940, the Luftwaffe was probing British defenses, looking for weaknesses before a major assault could be launched. At the beginning of August, with German invasion forces and troop barges being assembled on the French coast, the raids against the south coast of England were increased in size. The Luftwaffe began the next stage of their plan, believing that the British early warning system had been destroyed. On August 13th, massive air raids began. Their aim was to destroy the RAF, either in the air or on the ground, in southeast England. To put pressure on the British defenses, the Germans set high and low-level raids to different targets at the same time. Sometimes low-level raids snuck past the radar stations, and the first warning the British fighter pilots had was bombs landing on their airfield. 
so several of the raids succeeded in achieving complete surprise. This pattern continued in September, and the situation became desperate. Small civilian airfields were used in emergency, as many RAF stations became badly damaged. The Spitfire and Hurricane could easily take off from grass fields, but the maintenance and spare supply situation became desperate. Ground crews worked in the open and suffered heavy casualties from the raids. Many maintenance facilities were destroyed in the bombing. But despite this, the crews kept the fighters as combat-ready as possible, fighting in their own battle on the ground as the pilots were fighting up in the air. Some suggestions were made that fighters should be pulled back north of the Thames, but British command knew that this is exactly what the Germans wanted, which would have effectively given them air superiority over the intended invasion area. So squadrons stayed and fought for their lives there. To keep up the pressure, Germans began night raids to stop the defenders from repairing damage overnight. On one night raid, some aircraft bombed civilian areas of London by mistake. And this was a mistake that became a crucial turning point in battle. Hitler had specifically banned attacks on civilian centers, and he was still hoping that the British would become demoralized and sue for peace. But widespread civilian casualties could only harden the resolve of a nation to fight on, and this was the result. The British bombed Berlin in reply to this accidental attack. And fears grew that cities would be raided more often, so children were evacuated in a mass exodus to places of safety in the country, which also happened in 1939. But at this point, when it seemed the Germans were continually pressing on, they changed their tactics. Hitler was enraged by the attack on Berlin, and he thought that the attacks on airfields weren't destroying enough RAF fighters. So he ordered that instead, attacks happen on cities and industry to break British morale and destroy the factories that built fighter aircraft. They also hoped that RAF fighters would gather in force around the cities to protect them, which would make it easier for the Luftwaffe to shoot them down. But this change of plans was a mistake. And this here is an opinion offered by the site Century of Flight that has a lot of avionics history and military avionics history. And that is that the change of plans was a mistake for a number of reasons. It gave the squadrons a chance to repair their airfields and radar sites so that defenses became fully operational again. The standard German fighter could only carry enough fuel for a 20-minute flight over Britain, so London was on the edge of its limited range. The German raids now came within the range of another group, 12 Group, and their large formation tactics known as Big Wings. The group that took the initial brunt of German assault, 11 Group, had different tactics than 12 Group. 11 Group's fast response tactics with whatever was available, and meeting the enemy formations as far from their targets as possible, was best suited to their geographical proximity to the German bases. Squadrons in 11 Group didn't have time to assemble, and they had to get airborne and climb to height as quickly as possible, or miss intercepting the raid altogether. But 12 Group was further north and had some more time for large attack formation of fighters to assemble and climb to meet the oncoming attacks. German command allowed the organizations to run as best as they saw fit, and detail work being done on a group level, while German command dealt with the overall picture. Knowing that the target was now London and the industrial centers, British controllers had time to assemble a large number of fighters to attack German formations and break them up before they could bomb. The appearance of large numbers of Hurricanes and Spitfires came as something as a shock to Luftwaffe pilots, who thought that the RAF had been practically wiped out by the earlier raids. By changing tactics and targets, Germans had actually helped Fighter Command deal with raids. Well, for people living in the cities, this was the low point of the war, because night raids followed daytime raids and gave the civilians little rest, and this is when you get into the darkest hour period. Airborne radar was still in its infancy, but there were still some successes in detecting these formations coming. Beyond just the change in tactics, the structure of Luftwaffe fleets also affected how they dealt with the RAF. The organization of the Luftwaffe was very different from the RAF, which was organized into commands based on function. The Luftwaffe was arranged into air fleets, which were self-contained formations complete with fighter, bomber, and other elements. Three air fleets of the Luftwaffe, numbers 2, 3, and 5, were deployed to face RAF Fighter Command from across the English Channel in the North Sea. Fleet 2 undertook the main weight of operations against the southeast of England. Fleet 3 concentrated on targets in the western half of England, and Fleet 5 was used for diversionary tactics against northern Britain. The Luftwaffe had various problems which hampered its effectiveness in the Battle of Britain. It was designed as a close support weapon, 
moving with ground troops, not as an instrument for a strategic bombing campaign against a determined opposing fighter force. And its lack of heavy bombers made it difficult to inflict strategically significant damage on British targets. You just had to drop a lot of bombs that hit your target when you couldn't drop them with high precision. And the Luftwaffe's fighter force had no effective method of plotting the positions of fighter command aircraft and lacked any means of ground-to-air control of its machines. The Germans also suffered from supply problems and a lack of aircraft reserves through the battle, due to underachievement in aircraft production. The rapid advance through Western Europe in the spring of 1940 forced them to hastily establish a network of air bases across occupied Europe. Also, the Germans had difficulties establishing adequate local repair facilities, forcing the removal of damaged aircraft back to Germany for fixing. And there were also shortages of German aircrew. German fighter pilots were well-trained and had significantly more combat experience than RAF pilots, but it was difficult for the Luftwaffe to offset its losses of experienced pilots. Any RAF pilot who bailed out after being shot down over British territory could fly again but Luftwaffe pilots who survived being shot down became prisoners of war. So those are German tactics. What about British tactics? In particular, I want to talk about the most common fighter formation used during the Battle of Britain. The tactics developed by the Royal Air Force were based on the premise that the attacking bombers would have to fly from airfields in Germany and would be without effective fighter cover. Fighter area attacks would see the squadron fly in a very tight three-aircraft formation, over four sections with two sections per flight, meaning that a total of 12 aircraft with only the lead aircraft able to search for the enemy aircraft. Once they spotted the hostile aircraft, the squadron would position themselves according to the fighter area attack chosen. During the Battle of Britain, a typical Royal Air Force fighter squadron was to have at least 16 aircraft to enable 12 aircraft to be used while the other were being serviced or out of action, although at times, some squadrons were unable to meet this number. The squadron would be split into four sections. Each section was led by a section leader with two wingmen, with a color and number identifying each aircraft. So, for example, if you were the red section leader, you would be known as Red 1. When the battle began, the Luftwaffe were able to operate from the airfields in France, enabling German fighters to escort their bombers all the way to England. So when the RAF and Luftwaffe met in the skies above England and the English Channel, the ineffectiveness of the fighter area attack tactic was soon exposed. As with only the lead aircraft was able to look for the enemy, while the others concentrated on keeping formation, an attacking aircraft could catch the formation by surprise. Over time, Britain adapted its tactics, and as the summer ran into October, the German daylight bomber losses became too heavy. The bomber force started to operate only at night, and the damage they caused to Britain's cities was enormous. The German raids continued, but the RAF had started to develop night fighters equipped with radar, which could tackle the problem. The first AI, or Airborne Intercept Radar sets, were being fitted to different aircraft and proved increasingly effective as the equipment developed and operational experience increased. Over time, the Germans realized the RAF couldn't be defeated in 1940. Germany was also preparing to attack Russia so Operation Sea Lion was cancelled indefinitely and eventually abandoned. So the Battle of Britain, it was the first to be decided purely in the air and the first real test of air power as a defensive and offensive weapon. But the battle didn't end with anything decisive. Really, it just petered out. All right, now let's close out this episode by looking at some personal accounts. First, I want to give a litany of quotes from different British pilots And then I want to dig in much deeper with the account of 21-year-old pilot officer John Beard. So here are some different accounts from pilots. Tom Neal said, We did nothing but take off, shoot at the enemy aircraft, land, go to sleep, take off again, do exactly the same thing three, four, five times a day. That was our life. The Battle of Britain, to me, was just a horrendously tough rugby match in which the penalty of losing was death. Whereas, in a rugby match, you probably break a leg or a collarbone or something like that. There, the penalty was much more severe. Arthur Bonzel, a British worker who worked on breaking the German Enigma code, is an example of how important the radar interception stations were, so that you could know what the Germans were doing and planning. He said, There were two wide stations, the interception stations, which belonged to the Royal 